Friends, let's make a start. So I'm Philip McOsker, the director of the Von Hugel Institute for Critical Catholic Inquiry here at St. Edmunds, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to our first public event this academic year. Thank you for brazing it through the Fenland drizzle. For anyone who's new this year, and it's nice to see some new faces, uh, the VHI, as we tend to call it, is an interdisciplinary research institute named after Anatole von Hugel, one of the founders of this college and of the Catholic chaplaincy for Schauss in the university in the late 19th century. Anatole was an intrepid naturalist and anthropologist, a pioneer explorer of Fiji. He was interested in all things Catholic with a small and large C. That is, he was interested in both the broadest metaphysical and ethical perspectives, as well as the micro details of our riotously diverse world. And our team of over 30 researchers in all manner of disciplines try to keep that macro and micro lenses combined uh, when looking at the many issues which beset our contemporary world and church. Mm -hmm. Our th theme this year and last year, in fact, because there's so much within it, for our public events is Catholicity, Crises and Opportunities. And there is no crisis more important uh, within and out with the Catholic Church than the issue of sexual abuse. The re revelations of years and years of abuse within the Church, but also allied systemic issues like the cover-ups and failures in safeguarding, have shocked everyone for many years now. We are very lucky indeed to have the Jesuit Father Hans Zollner with us today. He is one of the foremost diagnosticians of this problem, as well, of, as well as one of those who is doing a huge amount around the world to address and remedy this issue. Father Hans is a nat native of Regensburg, a German Jesuit, a psychologist, and currently a vice rector of the great Gr Gregorian University in Rome, and most crucially, a <coughs> director of the Center for Child Protection at that university, which is leading pioneering research and teaching about abuse, both to diagnose the problems, but also to work towards ensuring they never happen again. Father Hans is the author of a book in Italian, The Church and Pedophilia, An Open Wound, and is an honorary uh, professor at the University of Durham. Father Hans told me that it was 27 degrees in Rome yesterday. Thank you very much for taking time out of your impossibly busy diary. This talk has been uh, in the works for over a year, uh, and coming to this dank and damp part of the world to address such an important topic. Some practicalities. Father Hans will talk for about an hour, and then there will be time for questions and comment from the floor. After that, in a change from our usual procedure, we're going to go for drinks in the VHI offices because there is another event in this room at six o'clock. And I must remind you, as is our custom, that this is a public event and there will be both video and uh, photos. If you don't want your smiling faces to appear in those media, please let me know. So please join me in welcoming Father Hans to address us on Catholicity and sexual abuse. Good afternoon, and thank you for the welcome to this uh, light in the academic world, where it is very warm, uh, at least in terms of research um, <laughs> and academic discourse. Thank you for the invitation, and I'm really grateful for the invitation join you here uh, in this famous place. Um, I will give you an overview about uh, what I think is the reality within the Catholic Church with regard to child sexual abuse committed by clergy. I will probably also uh, draw on experiences um, outside the church. I have been to more than 65 countries on all continents with this uh, topic, so I think um, I can present to you something uh, that reflects where we are as a Catholic Church with a large C. Um, but of course, we also know that this is something that concerns humanity at large. What my goal is uh, here this afternoon is uh, to help us, all of us, and I use the we and the us because in every audience that I have been to, I have learned something, um, that we learn to own the topic more. 
uh, to own it cognitively, intellectually, but also to own it as something that touches us, that has something to do with the church, our faith, our spirituality, and the people with whom we work and we live. Um, I think what I would like to convey to you that there are many implications on the personal, on the administrative, on the spiritual side. I would also hope that uh, to some degree you discover what you can do as individuals and what you can do in the positions you hold and what we can do together. Because one of the very dramatic experiences that I have had over the years was that people feel very much alone when they deal with this. This is true for the victims, of course. This is true for those who have to deal with the perpetrators, bishops, superiors, and others. This is very much true for safeguarding officers. This is true to a large extent for communities, parishes, dioceses. Somehow it seems that this um, scourge that uh, abuse and sexual violence are uh, translates into a sense of deep loneliness. And I think one of the challenges is that we discover what we can do together to change the situation, past, present, and for the future. Um, I, I think uh, um, one element, one area, one dimension that has been left out in the discussions within the Catholic Church, in the media, uh, in uh, the academic um, commitment to this, is the side of theology and spirituality. It is very unfortunate, to say the least, that within Catholic theology, but uh, this morning we had a conversation also with the Anglican uh, side, um, theology has run away from the theological questions that are posed by this reality of abuse as much as church leadership has. The women and the men theologians at least have not produced something substantial over the last 35 years on questions like what is the image of God in the face of abuse? How do you talk about redemption to a victim of abuse? What is it all about forgiveness and reconciliation when we talk about somebody who has destroyed a child's life forever? What about theological considerations about the face of the church, ecclesiology, when it comes to questions like, is it a church of sinners? How much is the institution involved in sinful behavior or negligence or cover-up? What does it tell us about the order, the sacrament of order, ordination, priesthood, bishophood? So there are lots of theological questions. I'm also a theologian by training. And um, I think that uh, for me, at least, it is astounding that we are just about to start asking such questions within the theological world. This topic has been delegated by church leadership, by theologians, and by many within the pews to psychologists and psych psychiatrists and to canon lawyers and lawyers. But the core business, if I may say so, of the church was left out. How do we dialogue with God? How do we pray about what is going on in our hearts, in our midst? So my understanding is that somehow we need to realize that the crisis that is evoked over and over again in the United States, they talk about the double crises, the crisis of abuse and the crisis of the failures of leadership the negligence and the cover-up, which seem to be more devastating to the morale of uh, 
Catholics in the United States and elsewhere than the abuse itself. This is certainly a moment of crisis, as the title of the, the series says, is there also an opportunity there? Is there something that we need to discover today? What, how do we understand our not understanding the issue? Not coming to terms that it does not stop. If you read today's Times in the UK, if you read yesterday's National Inquiry uh, report on Ealing Abbey, you think it's going on and it's always connected to the Catholic Church. Does it never stop? When do they learn something about it? Do we really get it? This is the feeling that many people have in this world and in this Catholic world. And uh, I, I think it is a question also how do we, how do we personally, but also as a community, how do we understand that in the face of Christ's cross? Is it something that we need at least to consider? In Ignatian terms, I'm a Jesuit, so forgive me if I uh, refer to that, even the two Dominicans that are here. Uh, is it a call to understand a bit more about the third week, the week of the Passion, entering with Christ in his Passion, as those who are not responsible directly hope at least nobody is directly responsible here in this room for anything connected to abuse or its cover. But we are part of that body of Christ that, that hurts. So, how do we understand that being called to be participants in Christ's suffering, in his body, in the church, where we have victims and perpetrators? where we have people who are engaged in dealing with the matter and those who have covered up, <coughs> those who try to commit to a better church, a safer church, and those who don't feel or at least don't act according to that insight. I think we are at a crucial point. Many people have likened this to uh, periods in the Catholic Church like the Reformation, a major crisis, and we will see how uh, we will be led, and hopefully we will be open to the leadership of the Holy Spirit in this, in the midst of all the turmoil that many go through. I never start talking about this without referring to survivors of abuse. I use the, the term survivor or victim interchangeably, because some want to be addressed in one way or the other. Some don't want either, but anyway, we have to use some of those expressions. So in, on uh, almost, no, more than, than uh, four years ago, at, at a meeting of the Pontivier Commission for the Protection of Minors, of which I'm a founding member, Pope Francis received us, together with uh, our leader, who is Cardinal O'Malley from Boston, um, and a Canadian survivor of clerical sexual abuse and sexual abuse by her own biological father had sent me this painting which shows the crucified Lord. He is crucified to the tree of life and a bird is flying away. The tree has leaves. So there are signs of hope, but what you can see, because it's too small, Christ's eyes are closed and he's crying. He's crying for the sins and the crimes committed by representatives of the church, by clergy and others. And he is crying for the wounds of those who have been harmed. She had sent this to me. Uh, with the intention that I pass it on to the Holy Father, what I did in that moment. And what you can see on the face of the Pope is how people want us, church, 
church members of any rank. B, empathetic, being with the suffering of people, entering into that dimension. And um, you see, the Pope cannot hold back. When, when he is with people who have suffered, his heart goes out. And he is completely absorbed by that. And there is no, no defensiveness. There is no boundary there. He's, he's just with that, and he takes it on. And I think this is something that all of us need to live, and all of us are invited to witness. Um, the situation in the church worldwide, as I say, um, I think I can speak uh, to about the whole church because I've been from Fiji, oh yes, uh, to Chile and uh, from Canada uh, to uh, Norway or whatever. Um, so the, the situation is of the last, especially the last six, seven years, that um, the topic is present everywhere. And especially after the February meeting of the presidents of the bishops' conferences and the superior generals of the <coughs> religious congregations that Pope Francis had called for this year, um, nobody within the Catholic Church who reads paper and, and, and opens his emails um, and internet accounts um, can say that it, he or she doesn't know what is going on. So it's everywhere. But the willingness to take it on is very uh, different. This is strange for us here in this part of the world, UK, Germany, Ireland, Canada, where it all started about 1985 87, US. It's strange for us uh, to hear that there are areas and large areas and many countries in this world where this topic has not yet surfaced. In the sense, it has not hit the headlines, it is not discussed neither in the church nor in society. I can say almost all of Africa is in that position. Most of Asia is in that state. Some parts of Latin America and Oceania are still at that level. So it, it is only actually a relatively small number of countries that have been dealing with this, but of course, um, the Anglophone world and the, especially the Anglo-American world is very much um, touched by that. So the, the openness is very dif different from one country to another. To talk about it, to talk about sexual misbehavior in most culture, in most cultures in this world, is a taboo. So how can you talk about the misbehavior of somebody like a priest? How can you report to police in such a case? These are all things that in, in our, to our ears and to our eyes <coughs> seem inconceivable, but this is reality. I have personally never encountered active resistance. There are, there is nobody, I, I, at least I have not encountered personally people who say this is nonsense, this is all uh, it's only something that um, media have in invented and so forth and let us pass over. I have not personally met also for our activities uh, in the Center for Child Protection at the Gregorian. I mean we have had much support also from church authorities. However, that doesn't mean that people are committed and engaged with that. To the contrary, what I perceive is that much of what is needed in terms of guidelines, in terms of norms, in terms of formation sessions, is in place. UK and, and, and all the other countries that I've mentioned, everything that you can wish for on paper is in place. That does not mean that people have really 
integrated, have really um, sort of made it their own personal commitment. It is still something that is sort of added on. That you, can, you have to tick it off because there are legal obligations, there's the canonical restrictions and norms now, but that doesn't mean that you willingly do something about it in terms of intervention, in terms of prevention and safeguard. So this is another level. And um, um, of course there's a, a lack, of, lack of knowledge, but, but the deeper lack is the lack of an attitude that automatically, without thinking, without deliberation, but spontaneously and willingly engages for the best of the vulnerable in this world. Uh, that is also the reason why when you s look into the Catholic world, it seems as if every single bishop's conference needs to make the same mistakes like the neighboring one. I don't talk about the neighboring country, I talk about the neighboring country. Why did the Australians or the US Americans not learn something from the Canadians? Why did the Irish not learn from the Australians? Why did Germany not learn, the German Bishops' Conference, nothing from Ireland? Why did the Poles not learn anything from the Germans? It's, it's a, a repetition of the same type of attitude, the same type of reaction, the same type of inability to really cope, if I may use that word, to cope with the situation. So it is also a question, actually, for me, a theological one. It's a practical, let me say, cause and root of disturbance, but it is also a theological. We profess one church. So where, where do we have the, the realization of that oneness, of that unity? in practical terms. There, there is little transfer of expertise and uh, of um, experience from one country to another. Um, it is also true that we have many diverse cultural, legal and historical uh, situations and factors. There is no one-size-fits-all approach. The English approach would not fit well with the Polish situation. And let alone that a US American safeguarding program is put in place one to one in Tanzania. That won't work. Not only because the language is different, not only because the symbols with which certain things and processes are expressed are different, but the way you you relate to people and you relate to situations is very different. The principles are the same and the, the analysis or the diagnosis is the same. <coughs> rape is rape in every culture, yes. But how you deal with that, how you uh, put in words what has happened, how you punish people, how you try to heal people and to help people, that is very different. The legal, the economical, the structural facilities are very diverse. So what is asked for is that, yes, we in those countries that have been hit by this since many years, we can offer something, experience and expertise to others. But then they also need to engage in the inculturation of those measures according to their language and to their uh, legal and cultural situation. <coughs> now, one ma main thesis um, that I have put forward over the last almost two years is that since January 2018, we see a different level of discussion taking place. And I call this the change 
to the systemic dimension. Until 2018, it was mainly and mostly one victim, one perpetrator, one bishop who had covered up, one diocese, one religious province, one national church that was on the spot, that uh, got the attention. And the attempt was to look at this individual um, situation, person, or institution. Since, I think, uh, the end of January 2018, that's not true anymore. Why? In, uh, in uh, January 2018, Pope Francis visited Chile. And the outcome of that visit was mainly, at least in the public, that he was heavily criticized for a remark on the allegations uh, against one priest in Santiago who was accused of abuse. And he said in an interview at the very end of his journey there, he said in response to a question by a journalist, give me proof. This is slander, the word he used in Spanish. So huge outcry in the survivors community. And OK, the Pope realized that uh, there was something to clarify. He sent Archbishop Schikluna from Malta, the former generally attorney of the church for those cases, to Chile, together with another kind of lawyer. And they were investigating. And they came back with the testimony of 70, 70 victims of this priest and the group around him of sexual abuse, abuse of conscience, and abuse of power. The Pope read the 2,500 pages report and he apologized publicly to the victims. And he said, I made a mistake. And I apologize. This apology was received well by at least a, a good number of the victims, um, especially also from Chile. And uh, he wrote a very strong letter to the bishops' conference. Now, this is here starts the change from my point of view. The Pope writes in April 2018 a letter to not the Bishop of Santiago, not the former Bishop of Santiago but to the bishops' conference. He addresses them, dear brothers, how come that over decades, we talk about 25, 30 years, this priest could go on, and so many people knew, so many people were affected, and nobody spoke up. What is your co-responsibility? Even if you are in office as a bishop only a few years, you must have heard of something about it. How come that nobody spoke up? Response, not by one bishop, not by uh, only a few that were in office 20 years ago. A response from the whole bishops conference. 34 bishops, in response to the letter, tell the Pope, we admit that we have failed as a body, as the National Bishops Conference in Chile, and we offer you our resignation. Now, since then, eight bishops have been uh, dismissed from their office, and two of them have been dismissed from the clerical state. So, this is, for me, the very first moment when, within the church, we talk about a systemic dimension addressed uh, through and by the Pope himself. Not a single case, not a single church, the whole church in Chile, co-responsible. You remember what happened exactly two years ago in the United States, the Me Too movement started off. From my point of view, I believe that 
this kind of reflection, this kind of systemic consideration could not have taken place had there not been other elements, and one of them, a major one, is the Me Too movement, that brought about the reflection about who are the, those who are responsible for sexual violence within the institutions, and who were the untouchables. Now, we get to the bishops, we get to the cardinals, we get to the pope. This makes, for me, the difference since two years or so. In the US, the case of the former Archbishop of Washington, um, the then Cardinal McCarrick surfaced. In the US, the grand uh, jury report was published in, on 14th of August last year that details horrendous numbers and cases of abuse committed by priests from six dioceses in Pennsylvania over 70 years. The numbers of accused or convicted perpetrators and the numbers of victims cannot surprise anybody who has read through the reports in this country or in Ireland or in Australia or in Germany. The numbers are more or less in proportion. What is new in this report is that for the first time, at least in my understanding, such a report highlights also and underlines especially the corporate responsibility of dozens of bishops in six dioceses over 70 years who did not act according to canon law, civil law, and conscience in the sense of moral responsibility. So what is it about the leadership in such an organization, which is Catholic Church, that uh, pretends to proclaim the gospel and has leaders who do, who do not do the necessary to protect the most vulnerable ones, children? So more or less at the same time, the first the verdict against Cardinal Pell came out, ending in a conviction because of allegations of abuse. Since then, that first verdict was confirmed. He is now appealing to the High Court. Um, and Cardinal Barbarin von Lyon was convicted in a first instance for cover, supposed cover-up in a case. Um, we had films in Poland around the same time, September last year. Uh, um, and uh, the, the German Bishops' Conference had commissioned a report into the abuse that had taken place in the 27 German dioceses. All this at the same time. This sends shockwaves around the world. Um, as I said, for the first time, there is a consistent, but consistent, insistence that this is a matter of failure of church leadership. And wherever I go, the first thing I hear is always, why don't bishop act more coherently? Where are our leaders? How come that they don't get it? So, and we talk about bishops, we talk about cardinals, the first time to the best of my knowledge, that a cardinal of the Catholic Church has been convicted to prison outside a dictatorship, ever. So we, we talk about the pillars of the structure of the church, those who represent the hierarchical church itself. <coughs> and then the next wave is, has already started to emerge, and here again, the Pope was instrumental for that. The abuse of religious sisters by priests in some parts of the world, which I believe will hit some African countries, some Asian countries, some Latin American countries, as hard as has hit the, the abuse of ch children or, or minors of age, our churches here. 
this would be a major issue, it, and it is emerging uh, in those countries. Uh, so since then, we have also come to see that the term child protection will not be sufficient anymore. We need to, to have a, a larger concept, uh, which has also been taken up by new legislation to which I will refer later. So, vulnerable adults, whatever that term means, has been introduced into church language now. <coughs> you won't believe it, but there are still reactions like the following out there. When you go and when you talk to people from uh, some African countries, some Asian countries, some Latin America, some Eastern European countries, some South, th southern European countries, you will still hear that sentence. This is not our problem, this is yours. You are the, the Western or the Central Europeans or the North Americans, you have that, we don't have it. It's still there. And uh, <coughs> you can tell them, ask the Congregation for Doctrine where the allegations come from. They come from all countries, they won't believe because it has not yet reached the level of public awareness, at least to an extent as it has reached the awareness in our uh, circumstances. Some people accuse the media of making that up. My question, my counter question is always, who has done the scandal? Who has produced the scandal? It's not the media. The media may make it more spicy, may make it more bigger, whatever, but the scandal in the root has been committed by the one who has abused another person. I cannot do anything. This is the general feeling and I think this, this uh, really portrays somehow a state that Ignatius would call spiritual desolation. Spiritual desolation, where you, you think, I can't do anything, it's, it's all gone. No hope, no perspective, no light at the end of the day. Un unless we get out of that, we will stick there. And Ignatius has a lot to say about how to deal with spiritual desolation. Strip your yourself of certain images that you have about the church, about, about what uh, is at the center of our mission, about our institutions. Strip that, go to the core. Let yourself be purified. Pray more. Pray more intensely. I think what I see at least is the contrary. I see much division and I, from my point of view, this has much to do with the effects of the abuse and the cover. It will go away, some people say. <coughs> no, it won't. It has not yet started. In most parts of the world, it has not yet started. We are not only satisfied, we are in a, a great state of fatigue with this. And this is true especially for the bishops. They can't hear it anymore. I have been to Australian dioceses where I, I was invited to address the priests and they had had five talks during the year on that topic. They can't hear it anymore. But it won't go away. And we have to deal with that situation in a different way. Otherwise, it will as long as we don't confront it <coughs> head on, it will stick to us. It's worse in other institutions. Or it's the same in other institutions. Please don't repeat such a sentence ever. It is much more frequent in society than we think. And there is a huge, but a huge, defense mechanism of society at large that does not admit that child sexual abuse is a, a very frequent uh, um, reality in the midst of society. The European Council has a, a campaign running that says that one in five youth in Europe 
is abused sexually uh, before the age of 18. One in five youth. This is the European Council. Eh? Did you ever hear any politician refer to that? Did you read any news about that? So this is denial. Society is, to a large degree, in denial about that. But the question is, what can we do as church so that this is addressed also at the society's level? But there is one thing that is not worse in other institutions. And therefore, we, we never can say so. There is a special quality to the abuse that happens by the hands of a priest or any representative of the church. Because as priests and representatives of the church, we represent Christ and God. So even if a boy or, or a girl are abused by their own biological father, which is certainly uh, an enormous an enormous wound and an enormous um, difficulty to get out of, of that situation because this man is the breadwinner this man gives you security and so forth so you cannot run away <coughs> but at least you can turn to somebody else beyond the father which is the heaven before but if a priest abuses to whom do you turn because this man represents God. So many victims of clerical sexual abuse have insisted that the spiritual wound is deeper and more hurting than the sexual act or the biological wounds and psychological consequences. And this is something which has much to do with what I said before. How do we really allow this kind of wound to enter our consciousness. <coughs> there are many false allegations. Many priests have that impression. It is not true. I asked the official in the Congregation for Doctrine a year ago, how many false allegations have you received on your desk over the 17 years that he has been dealing with this? He said very very few. There are, as in any crime, there are false allegations. There are false allegations for all kinds of reasons, but they are not many. <coughs> it is terrible for somebody who is falsely accused because there is possibly no other crime to, in today's world that is is more is considered m more heinous and, and, and but and it destroys one's life and, and career, of course. Forever, even if you are acquitted, <coughs> it will always stick to you. It happens, but it is not as frequent as people believe. Then, in every single interview that I have given over the last years, the question was, do away with celibacy and you won't have abuse cases. Um, and you can repeat over and over again that all, all, Government reports, like the Royal Commission in Australia, all scientific reports, like the John Jay or the German report, say there is no link, no causal link between celibacy and abuse. You can repeat this over and over again. People think to believe that. And I come to un understand that this may be part also of the denial. Because most 99.9% .9 or whatever of abuse happens by people who have no vow of chastity or celibacy. Which does not do away with the necessity to talk about when is celibacy becoming a risk factor? Not in itself, but when over time it is not lived out well enough it is not sufficiently well integrated and there are other factors like loneliness, overworked, lack of spiritual development, 
then celibacy can be a risk factor, but not as such. So I have come to, to tell many bishops also that, yes, we need all kinds of screening for the candidates to the priesthood. Yes, we need all kinds of workshops in the, um, in the uh, seminary formation on relations, on emotions, on <coughs> sexuality, and so forth. Yes, we need that. But as much as we need that, we need also attention given to the ongoing formation. All the more as, according to this, the meta-analysis of all studies that we have, the average age of a first-time offending priest, I repeat, the average age of a first-time offending priest is of 39 years. This is not somebody who has just come out of the seminary. This is somebody who has been for 15 years into parish work or any kind of pastoral work. That means there are certain risk factors added and that may bring about all kinds of misbehavior. Drinking or gambling or pornography or, or sexual relationships with minors. For a variety of reasons, some people may choose that. But it is important to realize that it's also a question of how do we form, train, <coughs> accompany priests, and how do priests live? And that's why I think it's also a systemic question, not only on a normative level, do away with celibacy or not. It is a question of what should priests do? What is their primary mission? Um, this, this question of celibacy is always brought forth by more liberal, if you allow that term, liberal Catholics. On the other side, the more conservatives say, do away with the gay priests and you will get rid of the problem of abuse. Again, there is no direct link between homosexuality and abusive behavior. Of course not. However, there is a certain uh, statistic that we need to take into consideration. And this statistic says that sexual abuse committed by clergy uh, was committed over the decades um, to 80% with male adolescents. So first of all, it's not pedophilia. Pedophilia is the sexual abuse of minors before the onset of the puberty. So it's male adolescents that have been the main target, the main victim group of Catholic clergy. 80%. Now this is just the opposite to what we know about society situation, where abuse of minors happens much more uh, against the girls and mostly um, mo mostly adolescent girls so it's just the other way around and this is statistically speaking highly significant so the question is how do we deal with homosexuality which exists we, we can't deny that it exists uh, among seminarians and among clergy so how are they invited to talk about it. or is the message you need to repress it you need to be, to be quiet about it which then may lead to um, abusive behavior in the sense that at a certain point people may not be able to control it anymore so there are uh, very complex <coughs> questions that we don't have time to address now but at least these are things that are said and repeated over and over again and um, it is not easy to get across the message. Much differentiation has to be done because the simple answers won't fit and won't solve anything. So I said that we are at a dif different level, the systemic level, and the Holy Father wanted to address that systemic level <coughs> 
when he called the presidents of the 118 bishops' conferences, uh, presidents, the representation of male and female religious orders, the heads of the Oriental churches within the Catholic Church, and the prefects of the Roman Curia, so the, the heads of the ministers of the church in Rome, to a meeting in February this year. And we proposed to the Holy Father in the organizing committee that we would go along three uh, topics for the three days. Responsibility of the ordinary. Ordinary is the bishop or the provincial in church language. So what do you need to know if you are responsible for priests or religious or other church personnel with regard to the canonical situation? How do you deal with that? Second day, accountability. Now this has been the buzzword in the United States over the last two years. Accountability. You know what that means in English. We have a German translation for that. But when it came to uh, uh, trying to uh, translate that word into Italian, French, and Spanish, which were the other languages of the, uh, of the conference, we discovered that there are no nouns that would translate the, the noun accountability into any of the Romanic languages. None. Now, if you don't have a word for something, what does that mean? <laughs> you don't think about it and you don't talk about it. You can describe what accountability is in, in those languages, but there is no specific noun, which means there is no concept, which means the most Catholic countries in this world don't have an idea about what accountability looks like. Accountability, for example, of what a bishop does or does not in regard to canon law provisions. Who is, who is the one person who can sanction a bishop in this world? Till now. It's the man in white. And only him. So, this means he has oversight over 7,000 bishops. Now, even if he had nothing else to do, <laughs> oversight about the, 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 the wrongdoings of 7,000 bishops would fill his day and night. So this is not sustainable. Transparency, internal and external. How, for example, how does a church canonical process run? Many bishops and provincials complain that they don't know where the process is once they have submitted it, according to the norms, to the Congregation for Doctrine. Sometimes it takes seven years until a final verdict is reached. And in the meantime, they don't know anything. They have suspended the priest, the priest doesn't know anything. The victim has given witness and doesn't know anything. The bishop doesn't know anything until the verdict is reached. This is, humanly speaking, untenable. External, how do we deal with media? I mean, media like to bash us, no doubt about that. And we are a very easy prey, because we have no, many, many, in many places in this world, we have no clue how to deal with the media of today and the social media. We, we were lucky enough to have um, Alex, um, Alexander de Forge uh, 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 for two major conferences, the spokesperson of the British, no, sorry, the English and Wales um, <laughs> Bishops' Conference, uh, uh, helping us out in, in two, two major conferences that we ran. Um, but there are not so many who, who know how media play today. So the outcome of that meeting were um, Vatican City State guidelines and law. Finally, we got to that point, and a new law for all religious and all priests worldwide. Our our laws have nice names. Vos estis lux mundi. You are the light of the world. 
um, which I will come to later. Um, we are still expecting uh, some <coughs> sort of handbook how to do process and the revision of the Code of Canon Law, Book 6, that deals with the penalty. Now, the law, was Estes, has a number of very interesting provisions. One is every single diocese in the world, 3,500, have to come up with an office to which, to which reports of allegations can be done. Every single diocese. Now, you think this is, this is something that, that, that is already in place. No, I, I presume that it is in place in 500 maybe. 3,000 are still missing. And there are dioceses that are so small that, or so um, lacking of resources that it is, will be very difficult to set up an office on its own. But it is now in the law that they should have an office that they respect the law of the states and the country in which they are. That there is mandatory reporting by all religious and priests, and for the first time this includes also female religious and non-clergy religious, like brothers. For the first time, church legislation deals with this, this kind of people. Until now it was only clergy that was on the spot. Now it's gone bigger. The protection of whistleblowers. And, and it's not only dealing with sexual abuse, but also with the <coughs> um, cover up and the negligence with regard to reports of, of sexual abuse. It's not only about child abuse. As I said, for the first time in such a text, there is mention of the term vulnerable adults, with which, sorry to say, I'm not happy at all because it is not well defined, not in this text, nor in any other legislation. It is a term that is so broad that in the end, you, you don't know who is a, a vulnerable adult at all. And if it's too broad, it doesn't say much. Um, there has been made one step forward in, in, the term, uh, in the area of accountability. And it was Cardinal Supich from Chicago who introduced the model of the me metropolitan responsible for what the suffragans um, do or don't do. Now, um, this is the diocese of East Anglia, Anglia. which is a suffragan to Westminster. Okay, so the Archbishop of Westminster is a metropolitan, and if the bishop of this diocese is negligent with regard to reporting of uh, allegations to the Holy See, we don't talk about abuse itself, but the reporting, the due process, if he's negligent about that, the Archbishop, and he's accused of that with the Archbishop, the Archbishop has to do an, an investigation into that negligence, and if it, it appears that <coughs> the uh, allegation is substantiated, he needs to forward it to the respective Roman office. So, for the first time, there is a, an intermediate level, which gives authority to the local level, the, the archbishop. If it is the archbishop who is negligent, it is one of the suffragans, so let us say the archbishop of Westminster is negligent, is accused of negligence, the bishop of East Anglia is supposed to conduct, or any of the others uh, that belong to that province, is supposed to conduct an investigation together with the help of the nuncio and send the report in case uh, it is substantiated to the Holy See. So, um, I wanted to quote the letter of Pope Francis um, from 4th of August this year, in which he addresses this as a letter to the, his brother priest, as he writes. But he, he talks about all of us also. We are firmly committed to carrying out the reforms needed to encourage from the outset the <coughs> culture of pastoral care so that the culture of abuse will have no room to develop, much less continue. The task is neither quick nor easy, demands commitment on the part of all. 
if in the past omission or may itself have been a kind of response, today we desire conversion, transparency, sincerity, and solidarity with victims to become our concrete way of moving forward. This, in turn, will help make us all the more attentive to every form of human suffering. So again, the link also to the spiritual dimension and the commitment. Um, just a few words about what we can do. Um, all of us can do something. We can talk about it. We can inform us. We can bring it up on the agendas of the places where we work, where we have something to say. We can continue in a research community to research into that. So there are many possibilities, but there is one thing that all of us can do. If it, if it had ever happened to meet a survivor victim of abuse, if it is within your capacities, sit down with that person and just listen. It will go away. I have already spoken about that. It won't. Um, I think we have a lot to do in the development of a, a theology of sexuality that people understand and don't bypass as most, if not almost all do nowadays. The theology of safeguarding, I've already mentioned that. It's missing, it's lacking. And understanding that safeguarding becomes an integral part of all our church activities. That's not an add-on that you buy for your smartphone and you, you switch it on when you need it. No, it is inbuilt in the device. That would be the vision, that we don't need to think three times or remember, ah, there was, oh, yes, we need to think about say No. It needs to be in our uh, normal way of doing things, in education, in pastoral, in uh, social, in uh, spiritual activities. Um, and there is this thread that I find more and more prominent in, uh, at least in my perception, uh, that uh, the abuse that has taken place, the lives of people that have um, has have been shattered, the the incapability for decades of dealing properly with perpetrators, the paralysis that many church leaders go through when they are confronted with this has created a splitting, a division. My hypothesis is that this has much to do with what trauma is all about, splitting off content. I can't go into the psychological <coughs> um, underpinnings of, of that, but I, 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 I believe that what we see in the splitting within the church, also around this topic, celibacy versus homosexuality, or whatever, and the splitting of parishes, the splitting of dioceses, the splitting of school communities where abuse has happened, is some kind of consequence of a traumatic experience. And that has brought about um, the insistence, on one hand, we need new law, and we resume to law, and, and it must be stricter, and it must be more uh, tight, and whatever. And this is the, the solution to everything. No, it won't. Because if the attitude is lacking, people will not comply with the law. We need law, but we, we also need a change of attitude. As I said before, canon law and psycho psychology, of course, need to be in here in, in, in the arena. But theology must come also to help. In many countries, there is no one church approach. There is, there is a different approach from religious, and sometimes within the religious, there are different approaches. I've met the, some bishops from some other part of the world on Monday, and there is, there is all religious, all, 
but one community that does not follow the policy of the other villages. And they are the biggest ones. This uh, is another sign of uh, too much splitting. Clergy versus laity. This is very strong in the United States. I've been there at the beginning of this year twice. and they, I mean, it, it looks as if they, bishops, and us, we know how it works and they don't. <coughs> Okay, um, there may be some truth to that, but, but that doesn't help the situation. So, <coughs> the understanding of that this is not something that will go away easily, and it will need all our effort and all our common understanding. This is part of where we as a church should be today. Talking about it. Uh, learning about it being open for new apostolates, for example, listening to survivors. Whoever has engaged with survivors of clerical sexual abuse or other kinds of sexual violence knows that this is draining. This is a long-standing and a very complex way of being with people. This is not done with one session or five or fifty. And it is a, 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 a very challenging on, on, on many levels for somebody who tries to accompany uh, people who have been wounded so grievously. But who, <coughs> if not we, should be willing to do that? I will skip now a few, um, but this is just a reminder that even in church documents, this is a quotation from the um, guidelines for priestly formation worldwide, which was published three years ago, and it says the greatest attention must be given to the theme of the protection of vulnerable adults and minors. This is for all seminaries in the world. So you you have the, the law, you have it. What is needed is implementation. What are the spiritual lessons? Um, I think there are a lot of spiritual lessons to learn for all of us. One is, how do we deal with our own uncomfortableness with this topic? Do we allow for that? Do we admit it? Do we admit it when we talk to God? How may I ask sometimes, I ask bishops and priests, how often did you pray with that, your situation, your perception, your feelings? How often did you really cry out to God with this. How often do we do that as a community? The lady I quoted before from Canada, she has one goal. And this goal is that in every liturgy, um, I mean, in, in not in every liturgy, but in, in, in every uh, diocese and in every bishop's conference and every parish, people pray regularly for victims of sexual violence. And her goal is that the Holy Father will celebrate in St. Peter's a Mass for in that intention. So, how do we deal with our own safeguarding fatigue, which I mentioned before? Where is the space of survivors in our midst? And what is the center of our attention when it comes to how do we define our mission? What is priesthood all about? What, what is at the core of our service? The whole question about clericalism, about power, abuse of power, comes in here. How do we understand? The church language, in a ritual way, talks about our service, eh? bishops serve the people of God. Okay. Is that really service? Or is it a uh, self-serving empowerment? Only if we are consistent in our approach, then credibility can grow again. In a few decades, in a few years, 
priests who were the examples for generations of people have lost credibility. And if you walk nowadays on the streets of, uh, at least uh, it happened to me, Melbourne or Brisbane, you are insulted. In Dublin, when you walk like this, you may be, you may be insulted. Um, why? Because the credibility is gone and, uh, and people don't believe that you live up to what you proclaim. This was the treasure of the Catholic Church and the Catholic priesthood for 2,000 years. And it is gone in, in, uh, in a few months and years. So let me just end with uh, a little ad, five, five words at least about that. The Center for Child Protection at the Pontificate Gregorian University was established 2012. And uh, what we offer is uh, education. We have a, a one semester diploma course, one semester diploma course in safeguarding, multidisciplinary, psychology, psychiatry, law, canon law, sociology, spirituality, theology. This is meant for safeguarding personnel in dioceses and institutions, religious congregations, and so forth. A two years master degree, to the best of my knowledge, the only one in the world, mm -hmm. a full-time second cycle academic degree in safeguarding. Then we have a blended learning um, program. We offer that to institutions, online units that are combined with face-to-face -face sessions in institutions like universities, like uh, colleges, like uh, seminaries, faculties, whatever. Um, on all kinds of issues like how do I detect abuse? What do I do with the perpetrator? What is the legal situation? And so forth. Uh, we go around uh, worldwide for formation sessions and presentations. We organize uh, conferences like in 2017, the child dignity in the digital world because this is the next, no, it's not the next, it's the present biggest threat to the safety of children today, as all of you who have children or grandchildren know, um, and we try to address that. And we have doctor students in all kinds of, of research in this area, and we hope also to spread in collaboration with international universities um, <coughs> research projects, for example, into the efficacy of safeguarding measures. So if you want to inform yourself more about our activities, here are the links. Um, please be advised that this is, that the e-learning program is not uh, open for individuals. Uh, it's only through institutions that this is um, offered. Um, I want to close with a few quotations from the Gospel, which I don't need to comment, nor to read. this icon, which I asked a Ukrainian artist to write, as they say, an icon in which is depicted, according to his imagination, how Jesus wants that the little ones can freely and trustfully approach him and be with him so that they find life. This is our mission. Thank you.